for joining us today. My name is Maya Gaylor. This is Muslim Viewpoint. This is our video podcast that we do. Um, it's powered by American Muslim Today. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I did see that you sent us a little bio about yourself, um, specifically related to your work that you've done with many refugees, many of whom were Muslim, and then you've gone overseas to other countries and done some work. Um, so can you just tell us about, you know, uh, your time working in these other places, in these fields, what that was like for you, what you learned? Sure. Yeah, I've had a lot of experience uh, working with Muslims from different countries. Um, my ex-husband is a Muslim, a Bosnian Muslim, and we have a daughter together. Um, so we lived in Bosnia for about a year. I lived in Turkey on the border with Syria and Gaziantep also for a year where I taught at a, a private school that was an Islamic school and I worked in refugee resettlement um, and then you know those refugees were of course from all over the world but Egyptian Lebanon uh, Palestinians so yeah I've been able I've had the good fortune of being able to work with folks from all different parts of the world yeah and how do those experiences either aid you in this journey or even lead you here to now running for Congress in uh, Louisiana. Yeah, I definitely think my time abroad uh, and working in refugee resettlement um, and as a, a public school teacher definitely informs um, my views on things like, um, you know, working in refugee resettlement, you hear some of the worst about humanity. Um, people have some really, really tragic stories. And um, I, it definitely informs my view on immigration, for example, because, you know, I want people suffering in like war torn places, people who grew up in refugee camps people who are stateless. I want them to be able to have a home here. I want to welcome them with open arms. I think that our country is a better country when we have greater diversity of uh, thoughts and opinions and skills. It also has informed my view on healthcare because I lived in uh, I lived in seven countries, seven different countries, and I've been I've been to the hospital in every one and I, I I've never left a hospital in a foreign country with a bill over thirty dollars. So I see that universal health care can work. It does work. You know, so we're the wealthiest nation on earth. I definitely think we can and should have universal health care here. Yeah. Um, so what are some areas more specifically in your district um, that you think need improvement? Um, as I've seen and, in, in, you know, looking you up, there is a majority Republican vote, Republican um, rule in the area and in, in the state as in general. Um, so what areas are you looking to change that the incumbent has not covered or you feel could be addressed better that are, you know, that you feel could improve your, your constituents' lives? Yeah, and the incumbent in my race is Steve Scalise, who is our highest ranking official politician in Louisiana. He's been representing Louisiana for, in one form or another, for about three decades. He's been in his current position for 16 years. And I, I like to point out to the people of Louisiana that our quality of life has only gotten worse in those 30 years. And we are ranked dead last among all 50 states, according to you, US News and World Reports for things like crime and pollution, economic opportunity. So, you know, what I would like to improve for my district and for the state, and really it's for everyone in the country, is quality of life. Um, especially where it relates to income inequality. You know, they say like money can't buy happiness. And I don't know if I completely agree with that, but money can buy a better quality of life. And in the United States, you need money to survive. You need money for health care. You need money. Having money can be the difference between going to prison and not going to prison if you can afford a good lawyer. So I definitely want to address income inequality. I would like to have a universal basic income. I would like universal health care. I think higher education and trade schools uh, and job training programs should all be free. I would like to expand different programs like Section 8. Unemployment. Louisiana has some some of the lowest unemployment uh, benefits in the country. So basically, I want a, a social safety net. I want all of our people to be taken care of. Right now, 66% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, and that's just unacceptable in the wealthiest nation on earth. What efforts have you made in your campaign to increase the Democratic vote as it is very low, um, you know, as I mentioned before, in a state that's 
majority red. Yeah, so I do, I am a representative of our, our party on the state level. I'm the congressional district representative. I'm also our LGBTQ caucus co-chair. And I try to attend our local DPEC, which is our, our parish level, which would be your county level uh, Democratic Party. So I'm trying to encourage people to get involved in whatever way they can. So that might be voting, that might be joining our DPEC, our parish level Democratic Party. You know, at that level, we have something called precinct organizers that go, they're like our most grassroots level organizers that go door to door and tell people about there's an election coming or, you know, they might give you information about different candidates. So yeah, I'm trying to engage our queer community in Louisiana. We had a call, I guess, a couple of months ago to raise money for our state party and for Kamala's campaigns. That was, uh, we called it Queers for Kamala. And we had uh, like Big Frida join that call. Paul and Punky Johnson. So yeah, I mean, different things. I also organize a monthly meetup for Democrats in my local community where we can just kind of hang out with each other, uh, have a drink and enjoy fellowship. So lots of different things happening at one time, but the overall message is to get involved in whatever way you can. For some people that may, might mean donating monetarily or might be donating your time. Right, and as someone who is kind of more tapped into the Muslim community and the concerns of the community, I'm sure you're well aware of the national outcry that we have seen for the ongoing violence in Gaza and which has now spread to um, other places such as Lebanon, which has left a lot of not just Muslim voters, but just American voters as well, um, frustrated with the Biden administration. And now they don't know if they can really trust Harris, you know, as she was his VP. Um, so what would you say to Democratic voters who maybe don't know exactly where their vote lies as election is upon us? I would say that, that Harris has not been the leader that we want or deserve when it comes to the genocide happening in Palestine. I would, however, still encourage people to vote uh, for Harris because if we're taking, if we're looking at just Palestine, neither Trump or Harris is going to be the leader that we want in regards to the Palestinian people. However, for the queer community, Trump is going to be an absolute disaster for us for protecting reproductive rights. Trump will be a disaster. For immigration, Trump is a disaster. So I think that Kamala represents kind of politics as usual as far as the Democratic Party is concerned. You know, our party is not super liberal. I think I am, I mean, especially in Louisiana, I'm very far left. But the Republican Party is very, very, very far right. They are going straight fascist right now. So I guess we basically have two viable options on the table. We have the status quo, business as usual, Democrats and neither Democrats or Republicans will stand up to Israel. That's not happened in my lifetime. But, you know, between fascism and politics as usual, I'm going to go politics as usual any day of the week. And I do understand and I, I sympathize and absolutely understand with people's frustration over the, you know, Biden administration and, and Kamala's refusal to call this a genocide to, to say what it is. Absolutely understand that. But yeah, I still encourage people to vote. I, in my lifetime, I've never had the opportunity to vote for a presidential candidate that I really wanted, um, that I thought this person's going to be amazing and absolutely aligns with all my values. That's never happened. I don't know that that is going to happen ever in my lifetime. So, you know, I would, I would still encourage people to vote for our best option, which is clearly without a doubt Kamala. Yeah. And uh, shifting to you, more personally as a openly queer person in Louisiana, which is a more conservative state, have you faced any kind of pushback or what has been um, the feedback from your voters? Oh yeah, I, <laughs> oh yeah. I'm our first uh, openly trans candidate in Louisiana and we've never elected an out um, legislator ever. We're the only state in the United States that never has. So I would say I get kind of, and it's hard to say because this isn't in person, this is online, and it's difficult to say, are these people in my state or are they somewhere else? But I get like kind of a really, really nice message for every like really, really awful <laughs> message. Um, but my campaign manager, for the most part, like deletes the horrible ones before I see them. So that some people are more thick skinned than me. That it does get to me, you know, when people say you shouldn't exist or, you know, I hope you die, stuff like that. But, you know, like I do see all the really nice ones and I've heard from 
former students of mine. I heard from friends from high school who are really supportive. So yeah, I mean, in person, I find that people are very reluctant to be cruel or say horrible things. In online, people just, you have that, that barrier between you and another person and people just feel free to say like whatever horrible thing. But I mean, I'm sure as a Muslim person living in the, uh, America, I'm sure that you're familiar with the kind of horrible things that people will say to you. So yeah, I mean, but I expected that. I knew that was gonna happen like the day that I, I announced my campaign. Yeah, and um, as a potential member of Congress, uh, how would you hope to address specifically the issue of women's health care? I mean, I know at the federal level, you may not have a ton of say as we have gotten rid of Roe v. Wade, which, you know, was the federal protection. Now it's in the hands of the states. Um, so what are some kind of uh, things that that you would like to introduce? regarding health care or just women's health care? Yeah, I mean, I would like to aim to actually enshrine Roe v. Wade into law federally. I think that's possible. I don't know if it's politically viable at this moment, but I would definitely, that's the goal ultimately. And then of course, you know, universal health care, um, which should include for health care for mental, not just physical, but mental health as well. And it's totally feasible. We're currently spending $916 billion on the military every year. So we can absolutely afford universal health care. It's just not been a priority for our nation, unfortunately. Yeah. And I don't know if early voting in Louisiana is going on. It might be because it is here in Texas. So it probably is most places, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it ends today early voting. How do you have any expectations or uh, maybe any hopes for the outcome of this election, either statewide or nationally? Um, you know, kind of what, what do you hope to see as an outcome? And then what is kind of a message that you would tell voters? Because, you know, voting is an important process of our our civic lives, but it's not all we can do. Um, so do you have a message for those who may be upset at the outcomes of the election? Yes. So for my race in particular, um, I don't anticipate winning this race. Historically, we've gotten, the Democrats have gotten 25% of the vote running against Steve Scalise. It's not exactly apples to apples in this race because we've re redistricted, so the district is a little different, but I don't anticipate that we'll go from getting 25% of the vote to over 50 in this one election cycle. But what I'm going for is 35% of the votes. So I'm hoping to move the needle. This is important for a couple of reasons. If we can move the needle, if we got 35%, first of all, that would be huge, but that makes our district more viable to big donors. So the next person who runs will be able to get more funds from the party, from big donors, and that makes their race a lot easier to run. But also, um, Steve Scalise is going to be retiring soon. He's not doing well health-wise. Um, I predict he'll be uh, retiring in the next 10 years max, but maybe a lot sooner. So when that happens, even though we're greatly outnumbered in this district, um, there's going to be a, several Republicans vying for his spot. If we can get just a single Democrat to run, we could win. We could win the district because of our, our, our primary system. It's a jungle primary system. So yeah, we could absolutely win even being outnumbered two to one. It's a possibility. So I'm hoping that what I'm doing now is kind of helping set the stage for the next candidate. I'm going to download everything, every strategy I use, every all my donors, all everything to the next person. I'm going to give that all to them so that, you know, they're better prepared and ready to run and I'll serve as a mentor for them if they'd like. So I'm, I'm there to, this is a, a long, we're playing the long game, not the short game uh, in my race. And then statewide, I would say, no matter what happens in November, even if Kamala wins, Louisiana is still run by a Republican trifecta. So we have Republicans running the House and the Senate and the governorship. So we still have to build um, build up the party here and fight bigotry and prejudice where it is in our state. We still need to get Jeff Landry out of um, the governor's office. He is an absolute, well, he's a Trump supporter. He's very, very far right. He is kind of, <laughs> a nightmare of a governor. So we need to get him out too. So I would say no matter what happens in this election, we still have our work ahead of us. And I would say to not give up hope because there we do have a possibility to take back the state. In Louisiana, there's actually more registered Democrats than Republicans. Most people don't realize that. They think it's a red state. It's actually not by the numbers. 
Um, it is by who's controlling the state, um, but we absolutely have the numbers to take it back. It's just, we say we're not a red state, we're a state that doesn't vote. Right. And just my last question, specifically regarding education, um, education is kind of falling in all of the states. What can be done from a congressional level? Because I understand that usually states' curriculum is or usually, you know, curriculum is run by the state and not um, the federal level. But I mean, you know, still, what uh, kind of options or implementations would you like to see from the state legislatures? Yeah, so Biden was trying to do um, with Title IX, he was trying to add in protections for like transgender students, and he did, you know, and that's tied to federal funding for school. So um, if they take federal funding, they're supposed to follow Title IX. What happened was that our Kate Brumley, who's our superintendent for education, just told everyone to ignore that. I'm not exactly sure what the solution is. Maybe we can, we need to be able to make sure that states have to enforce these Title IX rules. So that's one way that, you know, we're basically using federal funding to tell education, to tell state level education, like what you need to do. It's just, you know, when they blatantly ignore that, like they're doing in Louisiana, that becomes an issue. So I'm not exactly sure what the answer is, but we just have to be able to enforce the policies that we already have in place because, you know, at the federal level, they're trying to make um, education more inclusive and better for everyone. But, you know, we have these officials that are just completely ignoring federal mandates. So that needs to be enforced. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mel Manuel.